Hey everybody, I am Carolyn Byers. I'm the Education Director at Madison Audubon. And today I'm here to talk about urban canids, which is one of my favorite topics. I say that a lot. I like a lot of natural topics. So we are in week two of our summer camp. Last week was birds. This week is mammals. Next week is uh, herps. So herpetiles, reptiles, and amphibians. And then our final week is insects. And this is a free summer camp. It's virtual, it's open to anyone. So if you're just learning about it right now, you can definitely join in. All of the information's on our website and I will add a link in the comments later um, that you can just click and go find all of our summer camp activities. And right now I am going to hop on our Facebook web page so that we can I can I can see your comments. Um, so if you are in camp and you want to send me a message, say hey, say what you're seeing. I want to hear about it all. So send me a message. Tell me what you're up to. <laughs> you can hear my cat chirping at me. He's not a canid. He's a felid. <laughs> all right, so today we're talking about urban canids. And let's talk about that word first of all, or those two words. So urban means within a city or a town. Um, and so animals that are urban live within a city or town, not out in the countryside, not in a more natural habitat. Um, so canids is another way of saying canine, and a canine is an animal that's in the dog family. So our pet dogs are canines, and other animals, uh, let's see, I think we should make it a quiz. Anyone who's watching here, type in animals you think are in the canine family. I wanna hear about it. And try to keep it animals that would live in Wisconsin. We already said pet dogs, but what other animals do you think would live in Wisconsin that are canines? Um, and it doesn't have to be just urban canines. It can be anywhere. Okay, so we're, I'm, still, I'm still getting to the definition about canines because I want to see if anyone has a comment they want to share about it. Um, but let's talk about animals living in urban areas. Um, so most of what we know about wild animals comes from them living in, in, out in nature. So in forests and prairies and wetlands. Um, so we don't tend to study animals as much living in cities. Um, but there are a lot of animals that do live with us, right? Raccoons are one of them, squirrels and chipmunks. Um, and so we know that those animals behave a little differently in cities than they do out in more wild areas. And there's a few reasons for that. The first is that humans are really good at producing garbage. <laughs> and a lot of that garbage is, is food waste, things that animals can eat. And so when they live near us in cities, a lot of times they're able to eat that garbage. And those are the animals that choose to come live near us, the ones that can eat the garbage that we produce, which is not very healthy for them, by the way. So um, raccoons, for example, are very, very good at getting into our garbage cans and eating our garbage. Um, so there are a lot, there's a lot of food available to animals that can handle living near us. Um, and food is one of those resources that animals need to survive. They need food, water, and shelter. Um, in, if, if animals are able to uh, sort of handle the stress of living near humans, um, there's also a lot of shelter to be found in urban areas. So they can live under porches, under foundations, in sheds, in attics, um, sometimes under cars and garages. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of places for animals to hide in cities and towns too. So if an animal um, is not so shy or skittish or nervous that it's just too stressful to live near us. There's actually a lot of food and a lot of shelter to be had in a city. Um, all right, so I see some answers coming in on the comments. Um, I see that Freddie says wolves, foxes, and coyotes. Those are definitely all canines. Other people say wolves and coyotes and foxes. I see a rabbit on the list. Rabbits are actually lagomorphs, which is a word that I love. Everybody say lagomorph with me. I like the way 
the shapes my mouth makes when I say lagomorph. Um, uh, so rabbits are not a canine, but they do live near us in cities and they are really cool and I like them a lot. All right, so the, the animals, the, so those are all canines, wolves, foxes, and coyotes. Those are the ones we have in Wisconsin and, of course, our domestic dogs, but hopefully those aren't wild. Um, the ones that live in our, in our towns and cities most commonly are foxes and coyotes. Um, and those two animals live in Madison, they live in Milwaukee, they live in Chicago, they live in New York City. They are so good at living right near humans. Um, and partly it's because they are very stealthy. They're good at staying hidden and not being seen when they don't want to be seen. Um, they're also, um, they're not as stressed out by human presence. Uh, so wolves avoid humans uh, pretty strongly. They don't like being near us. Um, and probably with good reason. Um, but foxes and coyotes are a little bit better able to handle living near us. Um, so those are the two that we're going to be focusing on today, foxes and coyotes. And in Wisconsin, we have two different types of foxes, red and gray foxes. And gray foxes live more in forested areas. And red foxes are the ones that you're more likely to see um, in, in towns or cities. So that that's the fox we're focusing on today too. Um, oh, and I'm just remembering I have a fox skull on the shelf back here, right there. I might go grab it. I'm going to go grab it. I'm going to take my mic off. Let's do it. Got it. I'll put my mic back on. I hope that wasn't too loud for you. So this is a fox skull. I actually got it for Valentine's Day one year. <laughs> awesome present, right? Um, so this fox skull, and it's a little bright with my camera. There, that's a little better. Um, canids have a very long nose, a rostrum. Uh, everybody say rostrum. I like that. A rostrum is this, this elongated nose section on the skull. And canines have a longer nose. If you think of a cat, they have shorter noses, um, and you know every animal is a little bit different. That's just one identifying feature of a canine. Um, they also have these long, sharp canine teeth, and we have canines too. That's just the the name it's for the pointy teeth. <laughs> but then um, these canines also have um, the this set of teeth right here is called the carnassial teeth. And these are really important for carnivores. And they are, they're, the way the teeth fit together, like this, they're very good at shearing meat off of a bone. And you know what? Jasper here has volunteered to show us the short cat face. So if you look at his face, his nose is much shorter than this fox's nose. I bet he'll sniff it and then we can see a nice comparison. So cats have much shorter noses. Thank you, Jasper. He thought he was going to cause trouble, but I made him teach for me. Um, so this carnassial pair right here on their teeth, um, that helps them get meat off bones very efficiently. What else? Um, this is our fox skull. I like it. So a coyote skull is about this big, almost twice as long. And a wolf skull is just a little bit bigger than the coyote skull, but it's much heavier and thicker, and um, it looks a lot tougher and stronger. And that is because the wolf has a lot, um, a lot more space for muscle attachment, so they have much more powerful jaws and stronger muscles, and they need stronger bones to support that. And foxes have pretty strong jaws for their size, but um, they they don't have quite the bite that a coyote or a wolf does. All right, so let's look at some pictures of these animals, huh? I have a field guide here, um, my mammal field guide. You know I love a good field guide. And let's see, here is a picture of a red fox. And this red fox looks like it's carrying some 13 line ground squirrels in its mouth. But red foxes have a long, slender body, long, slender legs, um, and they usually have black 
black feet in the lower half of their legs and a white tip on their tail. And they have big, big, lovely, bushy tails. Um, and I wish I had some furs for foxes and coyotes to share with you, but I actually don't have any of them. So someday I'll get some. This is our, this is our red fox. This is what a gray fox looks like. And they are grayer. They have a little bit of red on them. Um, and they have a black tip to their tail. So sometimes it's really hard to see what exactly you're looking at. Maybe the lighting's a little funny, maybe you just got a glimpse of the animal. But if you look at its tail and you think it's a fox, you look at its tail and you see a white tip, it's a red fox. And if you see a black tip, it's likely a gray fox. So it's a cool tip. A cool tip about tail tips. Ha! A tip that I like. Um, let's see, let's look at the coyote. So a coyote is a bit bigger than a red fox. And foxes are um, lighter. Uh, so they're, let me see if they have a weight in here. Let's check the field guide. Um, they are, oh, in kilograms. A red fox is three to six kilograms. I'm gonna have to do a conversion, aren't I? Um, and a coyote is seven to 20 kilograms. So coyotes can be, can be quite heavy. I think I remember them being about 35 pounds, coyotes. Um, so they're like the size of a small dog. Um, and a red fox is more like a little bit bigger than a cat. At least my cats, <laughs> they're pretty big. Um, so this coyote uh, also has a bushy tail. Um, it doesn't have a, a lot of color on it. They look very gray. Um, to me, coyotes look a lot like the same coloring as a German Shepherd a little bit, except much smaller. Okay, so let's see. We looked at what their bodies look like. Let's look a little bit at their tracks and their scat because honestly, I've lived in Madison and Middleton for about 11 years now and I've only seen, let's see, one fox in this area, not out in the wild, and I've seen two coyotes but I have seen tons of footprints and scats. And so that is the best way to know that they're in the area. Um, so canine footprints, if this ma urban mammal uh, scat and track sheet is free on our website and I'll put a link in the comments, um, but canine footprints, they have these four toe pads and that big middle pad but their claws are showing. And that's because dog claws are always out. They help the dog run really fast. Cat claws are retractable. They, are, they can pull them back into their feet to keep them protected and safe and sharp. Um, and then when they need them, they bring them out. So when a dog walks, you can see their, uh, their claws and their footprints. So coyote tracks are about two and a half to three and a half inches long. And a fox track is about one and a half to three inches long. So there's a little bit of overlap in the size of their tracks. But something that I learned when I was making this sheet is that with foxes, there's a really big space in between these two pads and this one. So much so that there's even like a little line that you can draw to separate these two. With a coyote, there's not that much space between those ones. So that can help you try to figure out which ones you're looking at. Um, so their, their scat looks pretty similar. Uh, they usually have this little nice long tail at the end of it. Um, but the thing that I find really interesting is that there's a lot, there's a lot of dog poop in neighborhoods. <laughs> and sometimes it's from people who aren't cleaning up after their pets. And sometimes it's from coyotes or foxes. And I am, I'm going to take a little look at the comments right now, but I want to see if you all know how to tell if you're looking at a pet animal's poop or a wild animal's poop. So write that into the comments while I look and see what people are saying, okay? I want to hear what you have to say. All right, so it looks like Freddie said, I once saw two coyotes walking on Winger Creek when it was frozen. Yes, walking on frozen ice is a great way to see coyotes and foxes. And that is, it's like a whole new trail for those animals to use when it freezes over. And I, 
I have not seen one in person out on the lakes, but I have found lots of footprints crisscrossing over the snow on the ice. And I also, I set up some trail cameras with different classrooms. And one of those was um, right actually near Lake Wingra, not Lake Wingra, Winger Creek. Um, and we had it pointing out over the ice and we caught a coyote on our trail camera, a picture of it walking out on the ice. And it actually turned around and looked right at the camera. So maybe it saw that infrared flash or maybe it heard the camera make a tiny, tiny noise when it took the picture but it looked right at us. It was so cool. So I'm really glad you got to see coyotes walking out on uh, the frozen ice, Ready? Let's see. Oh, we have an adult who loves the videos. I'm so glad I do too. It's a lot of fun learning facts like this. And Chloe says, cool. But there are no guesses about how you can tell whether or not it's a pet animal's poop or a wild animal's poop. So I think I've probably talked long enough to make up for the lag in the, the time between when I say it and when it goes live on Facebook. Um, so I'm just going to tell you, maybe you're feeling nervous about guessing something like that. I won't, I won't tell you, I won't be upset if it's a wrong answer. Just know that wrong guesses are okay. All right. So if it's a pet animal, they usually eat pet food, right? And pet food is like little pellets that are pretty much all the same color, all the same consistency. Same if it's wet food. Um, it's usually, it looks like a paste, right? So their poop ends up being all the same color and all the same texture. It usually looks like brown Play-Doh, <laughs> some shade of brown, and either in a long tube or in little balls, little segments, but there's, it's, it really just looks like Play-Doh. Um, wild animals, they eat lots of different things and it's all different colors and textures and they eat um, often if it's a canid they're eating another animal so canines are pretty omnivorous um, they do eat a lot of meat but they also eat berries and some grasses and um, so there's there's there can be some variation in what they eat but they usually have fur and bones, little small bone fragments of the animals they eat. So if you find a scat or poop, whatever you want to call it, um, on the side of a trail in a park or on a sidewalk or in the grass in your yard, and it has a lot of fur in it, it's probably a wild animal. So I always look for fur when I find scat. And you think I'm joking, I always look. <laughs> um, and if I'm feeling really excited about it, I'll find myself a nice long poking stick and give it a little poke, break it up, see if I can find out what they've been eating. Cause sometimes it's really cool. I love playing detective like that. Um, oh, someone else has just commented that their dad has seen a coyote. That's pretty neat. Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about how to identify them, their tracks, and their scat. Let's talk about um, urban animals, right? So I know that there's a research project going on at UW-Madison called the Urban Canid Project. And I'll, I'll try to remember to drop a link in the comments about this too. But one of the researchers saw um, coyotes and foxes on campus kind of frequently. And they were very curious about why those animals were on campus when there's so many people there and what they could be, what they could be doing there. So this project is to study foxes and coyotes in Madison and the surrounding areas. And what these researchers do is they put a little radio collar on the animal's neck. And so to do that, they, they trap the animal and they, they sedate them so they're not gonna be stressed out. And they take some measurements and they put the collar on them and then they release the animal. And the animal is not held for very long. It's not stressed out by this too much. Um, so it's, it's really okay for the animals. Um, and what they've found is that they're able to use the radio collars to track them and how they move throughout the city. And so they're able to see where they go and what time they go there and if there are any other canids around near them. And they found some really cool stuff. So we talked a little bit about how there are um, sort of different ways animals behave out in the wild and living near humans. Um, and I suppose live, if you're an animal living near humans, it could, still could be the wild, but I'm just trying to differentiate between living in a forest or 
um, a prairie versus living in a town or a city. So anyways, animals that live in towns or cities, they have access to a lot more food and it's a lot easier to get. Um, if they just need to go dig through someone's garbage, it's easier than trying to hunt all night long for some 13 line ground squirrels. Um, and animals that live in the city do hunt too. They just have that other food source available to them. They don't have to hunt all the time for all their food. So life is a little bit easier in some ways if you live in a city, it's easier to find food and shelter. Um, can anyone think of ways it might be harder for a fox or a coyote to live in a city? You can type those in the, in the comments and I'll, I'll keep talking and we'll circle back to that. Um, so when they live in the wild, because food and shelter is so scarce, um, usually coyotes, because they're bigger and stronger, chase foxes out of their territory. Sometimes they fight them, sometimes they even kill them. So if you are a fox, you need to find a spot where there are no coyotes. Um, and it turns out, this, these researchers found, that that might not be the case in cities because there are so many resources and they don't have to struggle as much. Um, there, were, there were nights when they found coyotes and foxes foraging for food right near each other and there wasn't ever any truly negative interactions. So like, the coyotes didn't chase the foxes away. They didn't try to kill the foxes. Um, and there was another time these scientists found where there was a fox den and the foxes had been hunting rabbits and a coyote came and stole the rabbit from the fox. But that fox kept their den there, even though there were other dens right in the area. So they didn't move just because a coyote came a few times to steal their fox. Or not their fox. <laughs> Oh, to steal their rabbit. Um, so that means that the coyotes weren't too aggressive towards the foxes. And it also means that it was pretty easy hunting for the foxes if they're able to get more food. Um, so life in some ways can be easier for these animals living in cities. Um, okay, so it looks like nobody's answering that question either. You're all feeling so shy today. All right, I'm going to give... 50 life points to anybody who can think of a way that it might be harder for these animals to live in a city with us, okay? Even if you're thinking like, oh, people are noisy and it would be hard to sleep during the day. Whatever you're thinking, as silly or as true as it can be, I want to know why it might be hard for a coyote or a fox to live in a city. We talked about how it might be easier to find food. What's harder? 50 life points are on the line, guys. Type it in. I want to see. <laughs> okay. So um, let's talk about what they eat. So we know that um, they eat a lot of meat, right? What kind of meat do they like to eat? Rabbits for sure. Maybe some squirrels if they can catch them. Mice. Um, little animals like voles or moles. Um, 13 line ground squirrels, those are not as common in the city, but I believe that it is still possible to find them here. Chipmunks, for sure. Um, foxes and coyotes will eat birds out of the nest and eggs if they can find them. I think there are easier prey for them to find because those are pretty secretive things and it would take a lot of work to find a bird nest. And in the cities, birds don't usually nest on the ground as much. Um, so there are a lot a lot of things that they can eat. Um, all right, Pepe, Pepe Le Pew, someone commented Pepe, skunks. Um, yeah, I think they would take a skunk if they were hungry enough. I think there are a lot of other, um, a lot of other food sources and skunks are, oh, well, animals don't tangle with them quite as much if they don't, if they don't need it. Um, Ooh, yes, we have people answering. This is wonderful. Um, so if someone says if there are no animals around them, if there's not animals to hunt or maybe find other, um, find mates or animals that they want to live with, for sure. Lily says maybe they don't have enough food or they could get hit by cars. That's the one I was thinking of. Cars are really hard for animals to figure out because they didn't really evolve with them. And so a lot of urban canines get hit by cars. 
Um, someone else says people disturb the animals. Yes, it's hard to live near people because we are constantly trying to evict them. There's um, lots of different animal services or like jobs that people have where they visit people's houses and remove animals that they don't want to live there. Um, so if they, you know, set up home, they make a den underneath somebody's house or in their garage, those people might decide to remove them from there. Um, so that can be hard too. Okay, so it looks like uh, Megan, or maybe uh, a child at Megan's house, Lily and Tara all get 50 life points. Thank you for being brave and answering. <laughs> So it can be it can be hard living in cities for sure. There's trade offs. So it's sometimes easier to find food and shelter, but that shelter might be um, less reliable, um, and it's, it's it can just be dangerous living near people. We have cars, we have dogs, we have um, traps. <laughs> so um, there's pros and cons for living in a city for sure. Okay, let's see. We talked about how competition is hard for coyotes and foxes, and how it might be a little easier for them to coexist within cities. Um, and that's a really interesting find because out in the wild, um, coyotes and foxes do not get along. And so it was really neat to find that difference out. Those scientists were pretty excited about that. Okay, so let's talk now about how we can live peacefully with foxes and coyotes in our neighborhoods. So a lot of people... Uh, really like knowing that they live here. I really like it, for example. Um, when I saw that fox in my neighborhood, I was so excited and I, I was very quiet and I wanted to watch it for as long as I could. And the same thing when I saw, I saw a coyote in, uh, at Picnic Point. Um, and I just, I stayed still and I watched it. But I know a lot of other people um, feel really concerned about that. And a lot of the kids that I teach, they worry. They're like, Miss Carolyn, what if we see a coyote? And I'm thinking like, oh, we'll be really excited to see a coyote. But that kid is actually really scared because they don't, they don't know a lot about coyotes or foxes and they don't know, um, you know, how they'll respond or what to do if they see one. So um, if you don't want a lot of wildlife near your home, um, definitely want to keep your garbage secure so that animals can't get into it. Um, if you have a cat, there are a lot of reasons to keep them inside, but... Coyotes and foxes are really good ones because they might hunt your cat and either hurt it or kill it. So if you have a cat, keep that inside. Um, and if you have small dogs um, and you know there's a coyote in the area, you might want to go outside with your dog and not let them out alone, especially at night. Um, so if you do see one, a fox or a coyote, and it makes you happy, the best thing to do is to just be calm and quiet and watch what it does. Don't try to make noises. Don't try to, um, you know, approach them. They're wild animals and you don't want to do that. But if you feel nervous and you want that animal to move on, you can make yourself seem bigger. So stand up really tall, wave your arms. Um, if you have other people with you, you can get all close together and pretend to be really big. And you can yell at it and make noise and say, hey, fox, go away. Um, and they'll, they'll likely just, just move right along. Um, so those are the best things to do if you, if you see a fox or a coyote. And I'm going to go back to the comments. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask because I think we're almost done with this lesson on urban canids. Um, Tara says, what are 50 life points? <laughs> so life points are a way of... Um, honoring people who are brave and exciting and they do cool things. And um, I 50 is usually the increment that I give out. So I could give you a thousand life points or 10 life points. Um, they mean absolutely nothing. <laughs> and they're not redeemable for anything, um, but they are really fun and the kids I work with like them. So I brought life points into our lesson today. So use them with your friends, with your family, and maybe not strangers. Don't do that. <laughs> They'll think you're weird. Like you probably think I'm weird. Um, all right. Are there any more questions for me and my little fox skull? What do you think? No questions? 
I don't see anyone typing questions. Um, so I want to remind you all that it is week two of summer camp and there are so many great activities to get into this week. Um, I'm excited to make animal tracks with water on the sidewalk later today. Um, we're gonna run, we're gonna walk, we're gonna see how those tracks change. Um, mostly we're gonna stay cool because it's really hot out. <laughs> um, but I also wanna say that all of our programming is free and open to anyone, anyone with an internet connection and a device to watch it. And we know that that's sometime limit, sometimes limiting, um, but we also wanna make it available for as many people as we can, because we know that access to nature is not equitable and we wanna try and help fix that. So um, if you like our programming and you wanna support it, we'll add a link in the comments where you can go donate. And if you're not in that place right now, um, it'll still be here for you for free because everyone needs nature. We should all go out and just soak in the nature and relax and, um, well, take, take a few moments for ourselves and for nature. Okay, so I don't see any more comments. So with that, I think I'm gonna end this lesson. So I had a lot of fun talking about urban canids today. If you have questions and you're watching this later, type them in, we'll, uh, we'll try to get an answer to you. And everybody have fun. Bye.